Hello, I'm Dr. Sri Banerjee, core faculty for the College of Health Sciences and Public Policy at Walden University. In today's lecture, what I'll be going over is uh, Michel Foucault's, uh, uh, some of his philosophies and theories, which are uh, very enlightening in, in the context of uh, when mass atrocities take place. So what I'll try to do is go over Michel Foucault's um, uh, theories and philosophies and then tie that in together with understanding how uh, this applies to mass atrocities. So let's go ahead and get started. So there were actually a lot of philosophers that did write about uh, power versus resistance. Uh, initially it was uh, initially it was presented as a class struggle uh, between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, the bourgeoisie are more the middle upper class and the proletariat are um, kind of the working class. And so the class struggle um, would bring about a classless society. That was the main premise of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, then uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, in his Will to Power, he was also talking about power dynamics. Um, Judith Butler, um, what she did is um, she took Michel Foucault's um, ideas of power knowledge and then uh, took it in relation to censorship and hate speech. Um, and I'll talk about this a uh, little bit later about how hate speech turns into communal violence, which then a lot of times turns into mass atrocities um, in, in places that you may have heard of, like uh, Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis, uh, and then, um, of course, uh, Cambodia, which was more of a, a state-driven uh, ethnic cleansing, and then um, Yugoslavia. For the former Yugoslavia, you have and Srebrenica, the massacre. So all of these um, has some components of um, hate speech. Uh, if you look at Hitler's hate speeches, uh, which are uh, very famous, uh, and then censorship, uh, which was done in various countries um, where internet was actually shut down completely. Uh, and Antonio Negri is um, actually a US scholar um, and he describes the evolution of a total imperialist power. And he's actually talking about current day, not talking about history, which is quite alarming. So now I um, go into um, describing how classically power was seen before the 1960s. So this is for historical relevance uh, more than anything. Uh, the power of the state over the people. Um, that was one type of power. Of course, uh, through Marx and Engels' work, uh, class struggle between uh, bourgeoisie and proletariat uh, would bring, out, bring about a classless society. Um, but the problem is with, with both of these views um, and, and other views that may have come about is that they're not really looking at the micro level. They may be looking at the state level, and, and that's where the problem lies. Uh, the social relations at different levels, even in um, lower levels, need to be taken into consideration. Um, and only seen as a consequence, a power of primary exercise of power, not a force to understand in and of itself. So let's take a look at how power relations take place. Uh, power is not simply wielded, it's not like a weapon um, by one level of society over, over another. It's present in every level of society. Power is something that is enacted rather than possessed. Uh, it is not a thing, it, it, it's a relation. And this is one of uh, Michel Foucault's uh, main uh, teachings and, and philosophies. Um, uh, unfortunately, he was uh, one of the first victims of HIV uh, and uh, passed away from that. Um, so after understanding that power is not a thing but a relation, power relations involve discourse, systems of ideas which allows for possibility of resistance. Um, so his idea was that this discourse, if you challenge this, uh, you can actually uh, 
create uh, social change, positive social change. Um, of course, where there is power, there is resistance. And again, in a lot of countries, there, the ethnic cleansing started uh, with the Civil War and the resistance uh, to try to uh, be a, a self-ruling country. And to crush that resistance, a lot of times, um, uh, this, the state would go against civilian populations and uh, start ethnic cleansing. Uh, what's the definition of discourse? I just told you that if you challenge this discourse, then you can bring about social change. What is discourse? Well, I put in Michel Foucault's uh, main idea. Uh, discourse, discourse transmits and produces power. It reinforces, but also undermines it and exposes it. So pervasive power over the control of society has uh, over the attitudes, beliefs, and practices. So the power of society, um, how it controls attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Um, what is interesting is that um, in more um, high-income societies, um, there's not a coercion by the state to behave a certain way. Um, however, um, there's, um, there's kind of a subtle coaxing that takes place um, in order to sway opinion. Um, so things like advertisements, um, they're not forcing you. Um, however, they're wanting you to uh, purchase that item in uh, in different ways. Um, so systems of ideas, of attitudes, beliefs, and practices um, is the idea of discourse. If you understand the beliefs and attitudes, then you can um, resist. Um, and then the prison example is uh, very interesting, um, talking about the role of surveillance uh, by the state government. Um, and what it is, is that um, when the state government um, uses the prison um, and, and then there's a watchtower um, and then there is light that is being shown um, into the prison, uh, there's no places um, in of shadow that they can hide in. Um, and there's no way for the prisoners to know um, if they're being watched at any point in time. So this then leads to um, the prisoners being kind of thinking that they're being surveilled um, all the time. And, and so this brings um, uh, oppression um, into the prison system. Um, and, and, and this is uh, an um, anecdote. Um, I think this illustrates some, a, a good point. Um, it illustrates the state's power and how they can impose that power um, through conducting surveillance. So again, um, let's take a look at power dynamics. Uh, let me move uh, the video. Um, power is not a thing. Again, someone has to act on it. Um, it's not just perpetuated by the state or capitalists. Um, that was the initial idea in the 1800s. Um, an action that affects the action of um, other peoples. Um, an action that affects the action of others. Uh, and this is not necessarily affecting people, but affecting the action and the way um, they are. A uh, different relationship uh, between uh, employer and a person versus the state and the person. Um, so depending on the context of the relationship, um, there's different types. Uh, how you would be with an employer is not the same way you would be um, in, in the state system or um, within the home environment or different places. There's different hats uh, people wear and there's uh, power dynamics is much more complex than, than just having a state actor um, or capitalist taking over. So I would like to end uh, by taking a look at uh, the old adage, uh, knowledge is power. Um, the idea that knowledge is power um, is defunct. Uh, uh, he adds, uh, Foucault adds this idea that power is created by knowledge, um, which is controlled in discourse. Um, so yeah, knowledge does lead to power, but that power um, to begin with is created by knowledge and, and controlled by knowledge. Um, so power is actually 
kind of uh, it's anchored um, by discourse um, and it's anchored by knowledge which if understood then can be challenged and resisted um, so they create a synthetic regime of truth which is created by the people surrounding um, the situation um, so political resistance in the form of revolution may not lead to social change as was uh, described by um, uh, Marx and Engels. Instead, it is important to resist the discourse itself. And we see this evidence um, with Martin Luther King Jr. and um, uh, Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, where they uh, used uh, resistance, uh, passive resistance, um, to uh, try to uh, resist uh, the major imperialist um, people. So um, in, in terms of uh, the United States, this was a fight against discrimination. Um, so th these were ways that discourse was resisted. Unfortunately, where discourse was not resisted, this led to mass atrocities. Um, and there was a culture of appeasement um, in, in terms of um, the Holocaust. Um, there were many warning signs and risk factors for this turning into a mass atrocity. Um, however, nothing was done uh, Srebren uh, until later um, in World War II. Um, in Srebrenica, um, there was a lot of evidence of uh, UN uh, peacekeepers um, not, not doing anything um, but just witnessing um, the horrors of mass atrocities and, and massacres um, in Srebrenica and um, surrounding areas. Um, this was the the city was seen as a refuge and so what happened is uh, the troops um, from the state moved in and started uh, just indiscriminately um, killing and mutilating um, uh, people there and so um, these types of um, philosophies and theories can inform um, how these massacres and mass atrocities take place and how knowledge and power play a role. Thank you for listening.